In the last episode, we look at the three feasts that take place in the seventh month of the Jewish calendar. The first one we look at is the holy season of trumpets. We elaborated that two silver trumpets were blown seven times to signal the start of the march of Israel through the wilderness. Our study also highlights the various times trumpet is used, including the coming tribulation and the second coming of our Lord. Secondly, we look at the holy season of the Day of Atonement, where we discussed on afflicting our souls rather than a feast day. But the sounding of the trumpet of Jubilee every 50 years on the Day of Atonement, denoting joy and rejoicing, it was a day of deliverance when the price is paid for your salvation and mine. That is the year of Jubilee. The third subject we dwelt upon was the holy season of tabernacles. It followed the day of atonement and serves as a memorial of the wandering in the wilderness when the Israelites dwelt in booths. The understanding is also prophetic in a sense that the festival conveys the time God would remove the sins of His people and redwell them in the promised land, that is Israel. We then briefly touch on the olive oil for the lampstand and the sobret and the penalty of the death for the blasphemer. Finally, we talk about the amazing aspect that Sabbath was not just for man, but for animals likewise. With those man themes as our recap, I warmly welcome you Again, to join me as we dig Leviticus further. Greetings, dear friend. This is Through the Bible. God was teaching Israel several lessons. Now coming back to our study. He never permitted any one of them to monopolize the land so that the poor people were not taken care of. God was protecting the land and the poor people at the same time. Also, he was teaching them that the land was cursed, but that the time would come when the land would produce in abundance. Today people worry about the population explosion and the inability of the earth to produce enough food for the people. When the curse is removed, my friend, this earth will produce in a way never seen since the fall of man. God is the supplier of all human needs. God is the owner of the earth. The year of Jubilee, chapter 25 and verse 8. And thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of years unto thee seven times seven years. And the space of the seven Sabbaths of years shall be unto thee forty and nine years. This continues in the multiples of seven. Seven sabbatical years were numbered and this made forty-nine years. Then the following year, the fiftieth year, was set aside as the year of Jubilee. The year of Jubilee was a continuing of the number seven to the ever-ascending scale of the calendar. It was the largest unit of time, fifty years. Today we operate by leases. People may have a 50-year lease or a 99-year lease. God worked on that basis also. There were also two years of Jubilee in every century. Verse 9 of chapter 25, Then shalt thou cause the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month. In the day of atonement shall ye make the trumpet sound throughout all your land. This was the crowning point of the entire sabbatical structure of the nation. It was the year of Jubilee. In many respects, it was the most anticipated and joyful period of the Mosaic economy. The Keren Hayobel meant the horn of a ram, and in the time of Yobel came to mean trumpet. It is translated 21 times as Jubilee, 5 times as ram's horn, and once as trumpet. After Israel was settled in the land, it's difficult to see how one blast of the trumpet could be heard from Dan to Beersheba. It is reasonable to conclude that in every populated area there was a simultaneous blowing of the ram's horn to usher in the year of Jubilee. I think it would begin at the tabernacle or temple. There would be a person stationed far enough to be able to hear it and then the trumpet note would be passed on and on to the very end of the land. Verse 10, And ye shall hallow the fiftieth year, and proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a jubilee unto you, and ye shall return every man unto his possession, and ye shall return every man unto his family. 
In that day, people could mortgage their land, but in the year of Jubilee, the land would return back to the original owner. Now, that was the way God protected the land from leaving the original owner. The land could be taken away for a period of 50 years, but in the year of Jubilee, the land went back to the original owner or to his descendants. If a man had sold himself into slavery, when that trumpet was sounded, he was free. The shackles were broken. This is how we are free today. The Greek word for trumpet is kerox, from the verb keruzo, means to proclaim or to herald. The year of Jubilee is likened to this age of grace when the gospel is preached to slaves of sin and captives of Satan. But God be thanked, which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans six seventeen to 18 and then verse 23. The Lord Jesus said, And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. If the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. John eight thirty two and then verse 36. In the year of Jubilee, everything went free. All mortgages were cancelled. And when you come to Jesus Christ, my friend, the sin question is settled. He paid the penalty. It is all settled and you go free. He makes you free. In Romans 6.22, But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Romans 6.22 Stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Galatians 5.1 in this connection, it is interesting to note the words of our Lord in the synagogue at Nazareth. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Esaias. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and he gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your years. Luke four seventeen to 21 To preach the gospel to the poor is to herald it, to trumpet it. Isn't this the year of jubilee to heal the brokenhearted? to preach deliverance to the captives, to set at liberty them that are bruised? Possibly the best application and final fulfillment of the year of Jubilee will be in the millennium, as it relates directly to the nation Israel. I would encourage you to read Isaiah 11, then chapter 35 and 40, Jeremiah 23, Micah 4 and Revelation 20. A jubilee shall that fiftieth year be unto you. This is verse 11 of Leviticus 25. Ye shall not sow, neither reap that which groweth of itself in it, nor gather the grapes in it of thy wine undressed. Verse 12. For it is the jubilee, it shall be holy unto you. Ye shall eat the increase thereof out of the field. The year of jubilee followed a sabbatical year when the land lay fallow. God promised to provide providentially for them. They were to obey. God would provide. In the next few verses, that is from verses 13 to 24, the section explains that all property and possessions were to be returned to the original owner. This prevented any one individual or group from getting a possession of most of the land, while the rest became extremely poor. It preserved the balance in Israel. This was not a choice between communism and capitalism, but it was God's plan. He retained ownership of the land, and Israel held it in perpetuity. Isn't that beautiful? God promised his blessing upon them. He promised to bless the land in the sixth year. They would sow again on the eighth year, and they would eat of the old fruit of the land until the ninth year, when it would produce again. God makes it very clear to them in verse 23. The land shall not be sold forever, for the land is mine. Now redemption of property. This is verses 25 to 27. If thy brother be waxen poor and hath sold away some of his possession, and if any of his kin come to redeem it, 
then shall he redeem that which his brother sold. And if the man have none to redeem it, and himself be able to redeem it, then let him count the years of the sale thereof, and restore the overplus unto the man to whom he sold it, that he may return unto his possession. It was a long time from one year of jubilee to the next. If a man lost his property shortly after a jubilee, there was the possibility he would not be able to enjoy it the next time a jubilee year came around. So God made another provision for the recovery of the land. Now if there was a rich relative and he was able to redeem the property if he was willing to do so, and then the land could be restored to the original owner. It depended on the willingness of the kinsman. Now that was the principle that was used in the book of Ruth when Boaz, who was the kinsman redeemer, asked for Ruth. Verses 28 to 34 describes the laws that were made concerning dwellings and buildings on property. Depreciation was taken into consideration. There were different rules applying to the Levites. The redemption of persons, and if thy brother be waxen poor and fallen in decay with thee, then thou shalt relieve him, yea, though he be a stranger or a sojourner, that he may live with thee. Take thou no usury of him, or increase, but fear thy God, that thy brother may live with thee. Thou shalt not give him thy money upon usury, nor lend him thy victuals for increase. God was explicit about the care of unfortunate people. They were to be helped, they were not to be taken advantage of. In these following verses from verse 38 to 46, it describes the poor brother who probably had a low IQ and it talks about how he had to be protected from becoming a slave. He was to be treated as a hired servant, not as a slave. They were permitted to have only foreigners as slaves, which was a great step forward in a world of slavery. It is the adaptation of the Mosaic law to the Moors of that day. Now the next few verses, verses 47 to 55, is the application of the law of Jubilee to the person who not only had lost his property, but had to sell his person as well. He could have the service of a kinsman redeemer if there was one who was willing and able to deliver him before the year of Jubilee. You and I have a kinsman redeemer. He is rich. Yet for our sakes, he was willing to become poor so that he might shed his precious blood to redeem us. He has redeemed not only our persons, but he has also paid the price for this cursed earth. It too will be redeemed from the curse that is on it now. The law of the kinsman redeemer points to our Lord Jesus Christ, who is our kinsman redeemer. Chapter 26 The theme here is prologue to Israel's Magna Carta of the land. The promise of blessing, pronouncement of judgment, prediction predicted, on promise to patriarchs. Now this is a marvelous chapter. It's a prophetic history that covers Israel's entire tenure of the promised land until the present hour and gives the conditions in the future on which they will occupy the land. This section stands in a peculiar relationship to the remainder of the book of Leviticus. There are not great spiritual lessons and pictures here, but this is the direct word of Jehovah to the nation Israel concerning the future. This is history, pre-written, and reveals the basis on which Israel entered the land of Canaan and their tenancy here. This is an iffy chapter. If occurs about nine times and it has to do with the conditions on which they occupy the land. God says, I will, 24 times. God will act and react according to their response to the if. God gave the land, but... Their occupancy of it is determined by their answer to the if. Obedience is the ground of blessing in the land. This chapter is not only the calendar of their history, but it serves as the barometer of their blessing. Their presence in the land, rainfall, bountiful crops denote the favor of God. Their absence from the land, famine, drought, denote the judgment of God because of their disobedience. Now you and I are blessed with all spiritual blessings in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. However, there are some ifs connected to that as well. God loves you and wants to shower you with his blessings. 
But you can put an umbrella of indifference. You can put up an umbrella of sin. You can put up an umbrella of stepping out of the will of God. Now when you do that, the sunshine of his love won't get through to you. You must put down your umbrella to experience his spiritual blessings. Leviticus 26, 1 and 2 Ye shall make you no images, nor graven images, neither rear you up a standing image, neither shall ye set up any image of stone in your land to bow down unto it. For I am the Lord your God. Ye shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. These two verses sum up the first part of the Ten Commandments, man's relationship with God. These are essential for Israel to maintain residence in the land. They are to meet these injunctions if they are to occupy that land. The land is given to them, but their enjoyment of it, their occupation of it, depends upon their obedience to God. They are to make no graven images. The Hebrew word for a graven image means a nothing. They shall make no nothings. It's pretty hard to make a nothing, friends, and yet there are a great many people who make a nothing out of their relationship to God. Anything that takes the place of God is a nothing. The word given for graven images means a carved wooden image, and the word for the image of stone means sculptured stone graven images. The people were not to worship an image, or nor even worship before an image. This is a repetition of what had already been told the people back in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 30. Keep the Sabbaths. This is the second point. The third point is reverence the sanctuary. The Sabbath, the sanctuary, and this matter of worshipping God all come in one package. The character of Jehovah is the basis for obeying these injunctions. I am the Lord. Now in the next few verses, that is from verse 3 to 6, you will notice it starts with an if. If they walk in the prescribed manner. It says in verse 3, If ye walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and do them, then God promised these things. Their occupancy of the land is contingent upon the obedience to God's revealed will to them. God recognizes their free will. If you will obey, then God will bless. It seems that in that land, the primary evidence of the blessing of God in response to their obedience is rainfall. I will give you rain. We find this repeated in Deuteronomy and in the prophets. And I will make them and places round about my hill a blessing. This is Ezekiel 34, 26 to 27. I will cause the shower to come down in his season. There shall be showers of blessing. And the tree of the field shall yield her fruit. The prophets look forward to that day, to the day when this will be accomplished in Israel. It is a day yet to come. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper, and the treader of grapes him that soweth seed. And the mountains shall drop sweet wine, and all the hills shall melt. Amos 9.13 even in Joel chapter 2, verse 23 to 24, talk about the same thing. For he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. God's promise to them is the occupation of that land, showers, fruitfulness, peace. It's interesting that this little nation is full of turmoil. It's no use for us to point our finger at them because the rest of us can't have peace either. It's all tied up in one little word, if. God has promised to bless if certain things are done. Now in the next verse, verses 7 to 8, it says, And ye shall chase your enemies, and they shall fall before you by the sword. And five of you shall chase an hundred, and hundred of you shall put ten thousand to flight, and your enemies shall fall before you by the sword. Victory over their enemies would be a part of their blessing. Many times this was literally fulfilled, as you know. When they would return to God, God would raise up a Samuel, a David, a Deborah, a Gideon, or an Elijah. All these were raised up because God was making good his promise. They would be victorious over their enemies as part of their blessing. 
One man of you shall chase a thousand. This is also recorded in Joshua 23 verse 10. For the Lord your God, he it is that fighteth for you as he hath promised you. Leviticus 26, 9 and 10. For I will have respect unto you and make you fruitful and multiply you and establish my covenant with you. And ye shall eat old store and bring forth the old because of the new. A population explosion in Israel would be part of the blessing. Today, the world doesn't think that is a blessing at all. <laughs> the increase in the population would not present the problem of food shortage because the food would be so multiplied that they would have to remove the old to make room for the new. I will set my tabernacle among you. This is verse 11. Don't tell me that God does not abhor sin. Of course he does. And he will not compromise it in your life or my life. The tabernacle in their midst was an evident token of blessing. This is the great hope of the future which will be fulfilled finally for the eternal earth. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. This is verse 3 of Revelation chapter 21. I will walk among you and will be your God, and ye shall be my people. What a verse. This is verse 12. God promises to fellowship with those who obey him. That is also what he tells us today. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. 1 John 1 7. God wants to have fellowship with us. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God had said. I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Verse 13. I am the Lord your God, which brought you forth out of the land of Egypt, that ye should not be their bondmen. And I have broken the bands of your yoke and made you go upright. The future promise of blessings rest upon the solid history of the past when God delivered them from Egypt. He is saying to them, I have done this for you in the past. Don't you know I will do it for you in the future? He tells us the same thing today. Being confident of this very thing which he hath begun, a good work in you will perform it until the day of Christ Jesus. Philippians 1.6 You can be confident that since he has brought you up, to this moment, he is going to lead you right through to the day of Jesus Christ. Pronouncement of judgment. But if ye will not hearken unto me, this is verse 14. If ye will not hearken unto me and will not do all these commandments, and if ye shall despise my statutes, or if your soul abhor my judgments, so that ye will not do all my commandments, but that ye break my covenant. Listen to his three ifs in these two verses. These are the ifs of a breach of the covenant. Refusal to hear, refusal to do, despising and abhorring God's statutes and judgments. Breaking God's covenant will bring judgment upon the people and the land. I also will do this unto you. I will even appoint over you terror, consumption and the burning ague that shall consume the eyes and cause sorrow of heart and ye shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. I will set my face against you. This is verse 16 and 17. And ye shall be slain before your enemies, and they that hate you shall reign over you, and ye shall flee when none pursueth you. This is the first degree judgment, terror, consumption, burning ague, sorrow of heart, and crop failure. Their enemies will slay them, enslave them, and cause them great fear. This happened often in their sad and sordid history. We read that the anger of the Lord waxed hot against Israel and he delivered them into the hands of spoilers who spoiled them. This is recorded in Judges 2 verse 14, then chapter 3 verse 8 and 4 verse 2. What the prophets did in their messages was call their attention to the fact that they had broken the covenant which God had made them. And they shall eat up thine harvest and thy bread, which thy sons and thy daughters should eat. Jeremiah 5.17 Micah 6.15 Thou shalt sow, but thou shalt not reap. Thou shalt tread the olives, but thou shalt not anoint thee with oil and sweet wine, but shalt not drink wine.
And if ye will not yet for all this hearken unto me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins, and I will break the pride of your power. I will make your heaven as iron and your earth as brass. This is 18 to 20. And your strength shall be spent in vain, for your land shall not yield her increase. Neither shall the trees of the land yield their fruits. This is the second degree of judgment. If they were obdurate and continual in their disobedience, then God would judge them seven times, which indicates a complete and absolute judgment. Their pride would be broken. There would be no rain. There would be continual crop failure. And if we walk contrary unto me and will not hearken unto me, I will bring seven times more plagues upon you according to your sins. I will send wild beasts among you, which shall rob you of your children and destroy your cattle and make you few in number, and your highways shall be desolate. Now this is the third degree judgment. Plagues, wild beasts will decimate the population. All of this came upon them. You will find this in Judges where they traveled on the byways while the highways were unoccupied. Man had lost his dominion over nature. 23 to 26, it talks about the fourth degree of judgment. Notice the repetition of the number seven, which indicates completeness. If ye will not be reformed by me by these things, and will walk contrary unto me, then will I also walk contrary unto you, and will punish you yet seven times for your sins. I will bring a sword upon you, the quarrel of my covenant, and when ye are gathered together within your cities, pestilence, you will be handed over to the enemy. I would have broken the staff of your bread. Ten women shall bake your bread in one oven, and they shall deliver you your bread again by weight. You shall eat and not be satisfied. The enemy will breach their defenses, and the pestilences will strike the people. Captivity would be the end result. Ezekiel warned them that a third part would die of the pestilence and with a famine a third part would fall by the sword and a third part would be scattered. Ezekiel chapter 5 verse 12. Isaiah, Jeremiah and Ezekiel all warned them of famine which would overtake them and it all happened. This will take place again at the time of the great tribulation as we find it in the sixth chapter of the book of Revelation. Dear friends, we have such an opportunity that we do not need to wait for 50 years to be set free. We do not only have a loving God, but a God who also is rich and all-powerful to redeem us. The grace of God is so available that it is in such situation that inclination of our hearts can easily be revealed. The destiny of our soul is still determined by what we decide. And the eaves that set the conditions for either blessing or judgment still are relevant even to us. Obedience is still the sure sign that we believe. Today, let us ask ourselves if God is still our only Lord and are we still obedient to His biddings. May the good Lord help us walk with faithfulness. God bless you. Did you like this program? Give us a missed call now and you may be the next winner.